Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the 5-HT3 receptors. Okay, so we've discussed this experiment where what you do is you make this chimera protein where you take the extracellular portion of the alpha-7 um, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor protein subunit and you take the transmembrane region of the 5-HT3A uh, receptor subunit and you uh, stick those together basically to make a chimera protein. Then what you do is you allow these proteins to assemble into homopentamers and what you can then do is ask whether in response to ligands uh, these homopentamer receptors actually open. So what we can do is we can expose it to different ligands and see what happens. So we find that if we expose it to the ligands for the alpha-7,5 homopentamer, uh, such as acetylcholine and nicotine, it causes this chimera to open, which makes sense because the chimera has the binding sites of the alpha-7 homopentamer. Okay. In addition, the antagonists uh, of these um, alpha-7,5 homopentamers, such as alpha-bungarotoxin and uh, methyl-lycoconitine, uh, both of these uh, stop um, the um, acetylcholine or nicotine from being able to activate these chimera proteins, uh, which again indicates that these chimera, pro that, well, that the uh, ligand binding domain is this extracellular domain, and that's what's important for recognizing uh, the ligand and also in binding the antagonists. Okay, in contrast, and just as we'd expect, 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine or serotonin, the uh, agonist for the 5-HT3A homopentamer, this has no effect on our chimera, and that makes complete sense because we've cut out the uh, ligand binding domain for 5-HT. Okay, so we wouldn't expect it to um, show any sort of response to 5-hydroxytryptamine. Now let's discuss uh, the antagonists of the 5-HT3A homopentamer, and these will also be ineffective against this um, receptor that we've made out of the chimera. Right, so the 5-HT receptor antagonists then. These we're going to discuss in a moment when we discuss antiemetics, because this is after all what these are used for. 5-HT3 uh, receptor antagonists. Okay, they are also referred to as the zetrons, the, or the cetrons, receptor antagonists. And the reason they're called the cetrons is because all of the drugs, oh dear, what am I doing? Antagonists. All of the drugs that are in this class have a zetron on the end of their name. So these are also referred to as the zetrons. Okay, so let's see some examples then. Okay, so an example then, the most famous example, is on Danzitron, okay? And this is a very common drug used to treat the nausea and vomiting that people get as a side effect of anti-cancer chemotherapy. And we're going to discuss this uh, again in a moment. Okay, another Zetron, again used in the treatment of uh, anti well, in the treatment of nausea and vomiting induced by anti cancer chemotherapy, is Granny Zetron. Okay, and I've got four more of these Zetron drugs for you. Another one is Dollar Zetron. Okay, Dollar Zetron. Okay, uh, my fourth example is Palano Zetron. Okay, Palano Zetron. Um, and again, all of these are used to treat uh, the uh, nausea and vomiting that results uh, from taking anti-cancer chemotherapy. And then ramozetron is another example. Ramozetron. And finally, tropizetron. Tropizetron. Okay, so tropizetron is my sixth example. Okay, but ondansetron, if you're going to remember one of these drugs, uh, remember the name of ondansetron, and then remember that if you see zetron on the end of a drug, it means that it's a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist. Right, so, um, what these drugs are going to do is, usually, if we've got, say, a 5-HT3A uh, homopentamer, then these will bind to the binding sites for serotonin on that 
uh, receptor and stop the serotonin from being able to bind, therefore blocking the serotonin from being able to act on the receptor and blocking the effect of the serotonin. Okay, and what we find is that these drugs are effectless in our uh, chimera. Uh, so again, this is just as we'd expect, because in our chimera we've removed the binding site of 5-hydroxytryptamine, and these are all competitive antagonists. They bind to that same binding site, so if we've removed it, they're not going to be able to bind either. Okay, one more thing to say about this chimera that we've made. Basically, we talked about how the alpha-7 5 homopentamer had a high calcium permeability. We also talked about how the 5-HT3A homopentamer had a low calcium permeability. Okay? In our chimera, which one would you expect to be true? Would you expect this chimera to have a low calcium permeability, i.e. the same as the 5-HT3A, or would you expect it to have a high calcium permeability? Well, I'd expect it to be the 5-HT3A uh, calcium permeability because it's the uh, M2 uh, domain which lines the pore and therefore is controlling the permeability of uh, the pore to ions. So, I'd expect, since our chimera has the M2 domain of the 5-HT3A protein, for our calcium permeability to be the same as that in the 5-HT3A homopentama. And indeed, that is what you see. Okay, so that's that experiment finished. Uh, so it just basically shows uh, which portions of uh, these receptor subunits control the permeability of the pore and which uh, portions of the receptor subunit control ligand binding. Okay, now let's move on to uh, the use of these 5-HT3A receptor antagonists uh, to treat uh, nausea and vomiting that results from taking chemotherapy. Okay, so, basically, if you take anti-cancer chemotherapy, okay, so we'll just summarize all of those terrible drugs as anti-cancer chemotherapy, okay, then if you take it orally, okay, which many of these drugs are given orally, it will go into the small intestine. So let's just draw a little bit of the um, digestive system out. So here's the esophagus. Here's our stomach, terminating in the pyloric sphincter here. So here's this thickening, and then it will get a little bit thinner here to go into the duodenum. And then it will go round, continuing the duodenum like so. And then it will go into the jejunum and the ileum and so on. Okay, so the anti-cancer chemotherapy is going to come into the small intestine here. So we'll say it's in the duodenums. Um, we'll use the duodenum as our archetypal small intestine. Okay, what seems to happen is that the presence of the anti-cancer chemotherapy drugs seems to affect a type of cell in the wall of the intestine. And this type of cell is known as an enterochromaffin cell. So this is an enterochromaffin cell. Chromaffin cell. And the job of these cells is to release serotonin. Okay, so basically what seems to happen is the anti cancer chemotherapy seems to affect these enterochromaffin cells, which I'm going to color in a color. After all, they're called chromaffin cells because uh, they stain brightly colors, uh, bright colors when you stain them. Uh, to look at them uh, in histological slides. Okay, so that's the origin of this chromaffin here. Entero just means intestine, so they, they're the colourful cells in the intestine. Now, uh, when the anti-cancer chemotherapy goes into the small intestine, it seems to stimulate these enterochromaffin cells, which then start secreting 5-hydroxytryptamine. And where should I put this? I'll put it here. 5-HT. Now, there are sensory neurons, basically, which I'll draw here. So this is a sensory neuron, which has 5-HT3 receptors in. So let's say this here is a 5-HT3 receptor. So this is a cis-loop ligand-gated ion channel that recognizes 5-HT. So it will either be a 5-HT3A homopentamer or a 5-HT3AB heteropentamer. So this is a 5-HT3 receptor. 
receptor. And I might just put an R on the end just to clarify that. So let's have the 5-HT3 receptor in this turquoise colour here. So what's going to happen is the 5-hydroxytryptamine, the serotonin released by the enterochromaffin cells, is going to bind to this 5-hydroxytryptamine free receptor on this sensory neuron here. And this sensory neuron is going to go up in a very famous nerve, in the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve. So this sensory neuron is going to be part of uh, the vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve is a cranial nerve. It delivers information directly to the brain. So the vagus, uh, its name means the wanderer, basically. And that's because most of the cranial nerves, they remain very close to the head. They innovate muscles in the face, they uh, collect information from the face, they mainly do things in the face, uh, or at least in the head and neck. Whereas the vagus comes right down from the head. So let me draw a little stick man. I'm certainly not going to go into the in-detailed anatomy. Uh, so here's our stick man. But basically the vagus nerve, which I'll draw in purple. And you don't just have one vagus nerve, of course. You have two, one on each side. So the vagus nerves are here, let's say. They come right down into the abdomen, basically, and beyond. And they collect information from the abdomen and then relate it back up to the head. So the vagus nerve then takes this information on to the brain. And it appears that the stimulation of these sensory neurons in the vagus nerve, or in the vaga, vagal nerves, if we're talking about both of them on either side, um, this seems to cause um, the nausea and vomiting. So it, it seems to activate uh, the nausea and vomiting, okay, in response to the taking of the chemotherapy. So... If we deliver one of these drugs, one of these 5-HT3 um, receptor antagonists, it will bind to our 5-HT3 receptor and it will block the 5-HT that's being released by the enterochromaffin cells in response to the anti-cancer chemotherapy from activating these sensory neurons and therefore it will stop the nausea and vomiting. So these drugs, ondansetron, granizetron, ramozetron, dolazetron, palanozetron, uh, tropozetron, they are all very powerful anti-emetics and they are the golden standard, the drug that is used as the first choice drug if someone is suffering from nausea and vomiting as a result of anti-cancer chemotherapy. Okay, so these are all uh, anti-emetics. They're used as anti-emetics, uh, which just means um, anti-vomiting, because the proper scientific name for vomiting is emesis. Okay, and I suppose I should have defined, actually, what nausea is, because it's not something that people might not actually know the rigorous definition of. Nausea means um, the feeling, feeling sick. It's that feeling that you get when... Maybe you've been in a car for too long, you feel like throwing up, but you're not actually throwing up. That's nausea, okay? So you feel like throwing up, but you're not actually throwing up. And uh, some people on anti-cancer chemotherapy actually do throw up. Uh, and the fancy name for vomiting is emesis. So that's why anti-emetics, uh, drugs which stop you vomiting.